Uh, thanks. It's nice to see so many uh, old friends and new. Uh, today's introduction presented a little bit of a, of a challenge for me because our speaker is so distinguished uh, and he has so many uh, distinguished titles, uh, including uh, ambassador, uh, governor, uh, secretary. Uh, but we decided today that we would go with Mr. Secretary. So thank you uh, for coming. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to just mention, I noticed uh, when I looked at the calendar for the Carnegie Council this week, <clears throat> it's a particularly salty week. Um, I noticed that on um, November 11, which is Thursday, which some of you will know as, will recognize November 11 as Remembrance Day or Armistice Day or Veterans Day, um, Simon Winchester is coming, and this was just too good a title not to, to mention with the Secretary of the Navy here. The title of his talk is Atlantic, Great Sea Battles, Heroic Discoveries, Titanic Storms, in a Vast Ocean of a Million Stories. So, so it's a good week for the, for the Navy. Uh, thank you all for coming this afternoon. Today I have the distinct honor of welcoming the 75th United States Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, to the Carnegie Council. Most of you will best know Secretary Mabus for the critical role he has played and is continuing to play in helping America's Gulf Coast recover from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. This past June, as the Gulf Coast was confronted with the largest marine oil spill in history, Secretary Mabus was tasked with devising a framework for a long-term coastal recovery, focusing on restoring the Gulf ecosystem, economy, and health care. For almost two years, Secretary Mabus has spearheaded a national effort to bring the Navy's energy policies into the 21st century. As part of the Obama administration's priorities, he has set an ambitious agenda aimed at reducing the Navy's fuel usage in cutting its carbon emissions over the next decade. His passion and dedication are helping not only to re revitalize the naval fleet, but also, and perhaps most importantly, to help the United States as assume a leadership role in clean energy revolution. It is precisely such efforts that bring Secretary Mavis to the Carnegie Council today. Indeed, his work within the Navy and Marine Corps offer yet another example of how the U.S. military is charting new territory in the climate change and energy efficiency debate. As we learned this past September from our panel discussion, leading by example, the U.S. military is making use of renewable energy, investing in research and technology, and reducing carbon emissions. By all accounts, while domestic and international progress on climate change often seems at a standstill, the U.S. military and the Navy in particular, has taken threats posed by climate change seriously. We're most fortunate that Secretary Mavis was able to make time for us today, and I think I can speak for all of us when I say we look forward to hearing his thoughts on the U.S. Navy's new energy revolution. Secretary Mavis, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much, and thank all of y'all for being here. I've got some longtime friends here today, Mary's Powell, Daryl Prescott, Maurice Sonnenberg, um, who I appreciate your willingness to endure yet another talk of, uh, of mine. The Carnegie Institute, Ethical Behavior and International Relations, and the peaceful resolution of conflicts um, <clears throat> has a lot in common with the United States Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, we believe in that as well. Deter when possible. Make sure you build partnerships. Behave ethically and above board. You can surge equipment. You can surge people. You cannot surge trust. And so the, the Navy and the Marine Corps have today on station the Africa Partnership Station, which has right now a large deck amphibian around the coast of Africa doing training, doing humanitarian assistance, doing 
medical, veterinary, dental, uh, also building things like schools and clinics. Uh, we are a persistent presence there. The same thing around South America and Latin America and in the Southern Pacific. In Navy and Marine Corps 101, we, uh, we are forward deployed, we are expeditionary, and we seek to deter when possible. We seek to engage at all times. And in fact, the slogan now of the Navy, and you might have seen it on television and some of our recruiting commercials, is the United States Navy, a global force for good. So I'm very happy to be here with you today to speak with you. I'm going to talk about two things. Um, I'm going to talk about what we're doing in the Navy in energy, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Gulf Coast, because while they're disparate on the surface, I think at the bottom they show some of the problems with our insatiable <clears throat> need for energy and the way we obtain it and the way we use it. I'm going to say something that is absolutely self-evident. The United States military depends too much on fossil fuels. Those fuels come from potentially volatile places on Earth. We would not let the countries that we buy fuel from build our aircrafts, our ships, our land vehicles, but we do give them a say in whether those ships sail, whether those planes fly, whether those vehicles run. We give them a say because they provide our energy. So we're moving toward alternative energy for several reasons. One is strategic. We should not be buying energy from where we are buying it in the amounts that we are buying it. We should be far more self-sufficient in that. Second is tactical. To get a gallon of gasoline to a Marine frontline unit in Afghanistan, and gasoline is what we import the most into Afghanistan, you have to take it across the Pacific by convoy and road up across the Hindu Kush and then down to one of the forward operating bases. Or you take it across the Atlantic through the northern distribution network in the Baltics, across Russia, and down across the Amandara, again, to a frontline base in Afghanistan. It's incredibly expensive, hundreds of dollars a gallon to get it there. But probably more important, it's dangerous. The Army did a study about a year ago that said for every 24 fuel convoys we take into Afghanistan, we lose a soldier or a Marine guarding those convoys. And in the last two months, we've had six Marines wounded guarding fuel convoys. That's a pretty high price to pay for fuel. It also keeps them from doing the things they were sent there to do, which is to fight, to engage, to rebuild. So if we can change tactically the way Marines use energy, and Marines who are not known as sort of leaders of the environmental movement <laughs> have, have embraced this wholeheartedly. And so they're doing things now like solar-powered water purifiers and different sort of insulation for their tents. They are beginning to have a tactical difference because of the way they produce and they use energy. As Joel said, I've come up with five goals for the Navy, the most far-reaching of which is that by the year 2020, half of all our energy, both afloat and ashore in the Navy, will come from non-fossil fuel sources. And we're, we're get a pretty good start on it. We've already tested um, an F-18 Hornet on biofuels, the Green Hornet. 
and those of you who laughed are of a certain age and remember <laughs> the Green Hornet. The biofuel it was made from is camelina, uh, seed from the mustard family. We've also tested just recently an MH-60 helicopter, one of the big helicopters. My naval aide, who is a 60 pilot, calls them God's machines, but we flew it on biofuels. We have tested some of our surface ships on a, an algae-based biofuel. So we are, we're making some, some big strides, and by 2016, we're gonna put, we're gonna deploy, not just put to sea, but deploy the Great Green Fleet, which will be a carrier strike group that uses only alternative fuels. Now we've got a head start. All our carriers, all our submarines are nuclear, but the other ships, the surface ships that we use, the aircraft that we use, are all going toward biofuels. On shore, the Navy has 3.3 million acres of land. We have 72,500 buildings. And Joel and I were talking earlier that we can do things that sometimes it's much harder to do if you're a mayor of a city or the governor of a state. We can mandate how buildings are built. We can set down goals and actually reach them um, by the way we buy things, by the way we build things. The federal government uses 2% of all the fossil fuels that America uses. Department of Defense uses more than 90% of what the federal government does. Navy and Marine Corps use about a third of what the federal government does in DOD. So you're talking about, we use about 1% of all the fossil energy that America does. That's a pretty big market. And in a, the, the two things that we have seen, the two impediments, possible impediments that we have seen, number one, is the cost. Alternative fuels simply cost a lot right now because there's not much market for it. And secondly is infrastructure. But just since we've been doing this for a year, the price of biofuels has dropped in half that we have been buying. And to reverse a line from the movie Field of Dreams, if the Navy comes, they will build it. <laughs> if we create a market we think that the infrastructure will come and the price will go down. And we've already begun to see that. We've been dealing with people like venture capitalists uh, saying, here's our need. We've been dealing with the Department of Agriculture, working with farmers and the military. Our first pilot project with agriculture is in Hawaii. Hawaii is the most dependent state of all 50 states on imported oil and gas, as you can imagine. Uh, their farmers are also hurting. Because we've got such a big military presence there, we're looking into, and we're actually beginning to develop biofuels, uh, which will help Hawaiian farmers and which will help the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps installations that are there. By 2020, half of all our bases, at least half, are going to be net zero in terms of energy usage. Now we've already got one, China Lake, which because of geothermal energy is now giving energy back to the grid. Now we've invested in about 100 megawatts of solar. We're doing wind, we're doing geothermal, hydrothermal, wave, action, we are offering our bases as test beds for new technologies and we've been working with the Department of Energy to do that. Finally, we've been working with the Small Business Administration to help some of the entrepreneurs that are in this line of work. Now, we just opened a website called Green Biz on the Navy, 
on the Navy website so that if you're interested in alternative energy, you've got a single point to go to and help in getting working through some of the, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, sometime confusing governmental acquisition <laughs> rules and regulations. So I think we're, we're making a good start. We're beginning to move, to move the Navy and the Marine Corps off of fossil fuels for strategic reasons, for tactical reasons, and because we ought to be a good steward of this planet and of its resources. Um, the Navy has always led when energy sources have changed. We went from sail to coal in the 1850s. We went from coal to oil at the beginning of the 20th century. We went to nuclear in the 1950s. And every single time, every time, there was a group of folks who said, you're trading one form of very proven energy for another form that you don't know if it's going to work or not. We've got the infrastructure for this. Look at all these sail makers. <laughs> look, look at all the coaling stations around the world. And you're trading it in? I'm absolutely convinced that this is going to be another time when the Navy is going to lead the country in terms of changing the way we produce and the way we use energy. And now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. This summer, President Obama called and asked if I would head up an effort to come up with a long-term reconstruction plan for the Gulf in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon well disaster. I'm a child of the coast. I grew up in Mississippi, lived most of my, my life there. Uh, have a very special feeling and relationship to it. But it's also America's Gulf. So much of our energy comes from that. So much of our seafood comes out of that. And so much of our tourism depends on that. And while the environmental impacts may not have been quite as great as we once feared, although the evidence is still coming in on that, the effects of this spill are going to be felt for a long, long time. This is a region that had Katrina and Rita. It had Ike. It was reeling from natural disasters, but was beginning to come back uh, when the well blew out. And things like tourism just dropped off a cliff. People who fish for a living, people who run sport fishing or operations for a living, people who run hotels and motels and restaurants. And so the challenge was, okay, once we get past the, the well, once it's capped, once it's killed, then what? How do we make the South and the Gulf and those five states better than it was the day before the well blew out? So I sort of relied on muscle memory. It, um, I went back to politics, and basically I went and listened a lot, because people will tell you what needs to be done if you'll take the time to listen to them for a little while. So I and a lot of the people who are with me today went to the Gulf. We, we traveled more than 16,000 miles through those five states. We held more than 40 major events, including town halls in all five states. We had tens of thousands of people that came. And basically, they told you what needed to happen. Now, three things needed to be addressed. It was pretty clear. One was the environmental issue. Second was the economic harm. And third were health issues, perhaps long-term health issues, and mental health issues that, that had arisen from there. That was the easy part. You knew what you had to deal with. And there are all sorts of laws and agencies that come in on this. 
uh, there are more than two dozen federal agencies that have some sort of stake in this. And every one of them, and this will surprise you again, every one of them had an opinion usually strongly held as to exactly what needed to be done. But my report tried to focus on what was essential to bringing the coast back. And there were three recommendations that my report, which I gave to the president in September, which I'm happy to say that he has accepted and has gotten um, good, a good response from Republicans and Democrats in Congress. Uh, and everybody, I think, from the coast, congressmen, senators, and governors that have commented upon it, upon the plan, have received it favorably. What it said, number one, you've got to have a, a stable funding source. And you've got a, um, a situation now, something called NERDA, National Resources, something damage, damage assessment. Yeah, I'm from the Pentagon, I ought to know acronyms. <laughs> Natural Resources Damage Assessment, which is actually looking at the harm, the actual harm cause. BP, the responsible party, has got to pay for that. But over and above that, there is fine money, civil fines that will be levied against BP for spilling the oil. Now, we don't know how much those are going to be. It, it depends. There's a wide range. Uh, it depends on how much culpability is found uh, on behalf of the responsible party. It, um, it's a pretty big range. It ranges all the way up to $4,400 a barrel spill. There were 4.9 million, million barrels spilled into the Gulf. This money, and we've never had anything even remotely this size in the Gulf. This money, if the law stays the way it is, will go into a trust fund and sit there waiting for the next spill. And it will be used for the next spill only if there's not a responsible party. So the odds are it will go there and sit maybe forever. It won't go to reduce a deficit. It won't go to anything else. It will simply go there and sit. And so I said in my report that a significant part of this ought to be pulled out and sent back to the Gulf. The Gulf was a place that took the risk. The Gulf was a place that took the damage. And the money from the fines ought to go to the Gulf. A significant part of it should go there. Secondly, that it ought to be a plan that comes up from the Gulf and not mandated to the Gulf. And so as a management structure, I recommended a Gulf Restoration Council that had state participation in it that decided how these monies were to be used. Now, a smaller percentage of the fines, some money would go straight to the states, straight to the governors to, for them to jumpstart the, the recovery effort. And also that for health and mental health, Places like Health and Human Services were working pretty well in terms of making sure that BP paid for what they needed to pay for uh, out of this and to keep, to keep doing that. But finally, that there ought to be a private response as well. That there ought to be some way for the people who are on the Gulf, for the companies and the organizations who are on the Gulf to have a response. And we recommended that we try to put together something that would allow private involvement in this and not just a governmental response. That's where we are. Congress, we hope, is going to take up these things. Um, the day-to-day -day has been transitioned to an organization I recommended be set up called the Gulf Ecosystem uh, Restoration Task Force. It's headed by Lisa Jackson. Uh, head of Environmental Protection Agency, and also from New Orleans. And it's doing, it's working closely with the NERDA process. 
Those are the two energy things, the Gulf, the Navy, that I've been dealing with over the past few months. But one of the things that I've found connects these two is as I have traveled, as I have traveled outside the United States, I've discovered this is not a U.S. only situation. I've stopped in both Greenland and Iceland in the past three weeks to talk to them a lot about the Arctic because everybody thinks there's going to be a, an ice-free Arctic at least in the summertime within the next quarter century. And that has profound implications for the Navy and for our presence and for the resources that are in the Arctic and how, how and if they're going to be uh, to be used, but they all wanted to hear about the Gulf. They all wanted to know what was being done because they're all looking for energy. And they're all looking in deep water, in harsh climates, in places that are inherently risky to look for energy. They all also are worried about energy dependence. And I'll just give one example. Our NATO allies are dependent on other places for their energy. And they are concerned that energy could be used as a weapon against them. And we ought to be concerned because if it's our NATO allies, it may determine sort of what our response and what our responsibilities are there. So this is not just an American issue. This is an international issue, and it's one that we have been working closely with a lot of different countries in terms of research, in terms of how we do this, in terms of trying to pull us away from our incredible reliance on very iffy fossil fuels. Those are the two things we know what we need to do. We absolutely know how to get there. But it's a case of being halfway home, but a long way to go. We actually have to follow through. We actually have to do a lot more hard work. We actually have to not only talk the talk, but actually walk the walk in doing some of these things. The Navy, the Marine Corps are absolutely committed to doing that. And for every one of those sailors, Marines out there who are committed to doing this and who are committed to freedom and democracy, you ought to be, and I know you are, very proud of them. Thank you very much. Well, in a country looking for leadership, I think we found some. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the secretary has uh, agreed to take some questions. So you know, you know the routine. Please wait for the microphone. Identify yourself. And please keep your questions brief and to the point. And I will try to do the same with my answers. <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Tyes. I'm with the Naval War College Foundation. Mr. Secretary, you mentioned nuclear, and clearly the Navy has had a, an amazing safety record with nuclear. Why not expand it to other platforms? The reason nuclear has been only on carriers and subs, and you know, 30 years ago we put nuclear on some cruisers, is purely a matter of economics. Um, oil has to be at about $180 a barrel for a sustained period of time for it to make sense to put nuclear. And with all the upfront cost, uh, not only in terms of putting the, um, the propulsion system onto a ship, but also the shore support, you know, which is expensive, and also the training. I mean, and the, no pun intended, it's no accident that we have such a good safety record. It's because the training is so intense. It's because the, the procedures around nuclear 
are so rigorous and so well enforced and you simply can't relax those standards. Um, it, it is always an option out there. It's, it's simply we can't afford to, um, to put it on other, other hull forms right now unless the price of oil goes up. And, and that's one of the reasons I started looking at biofuels. Second, the other reason I started looking at biofuels and other alternative fuels was we have 288 ships in the battle fleet right now. We've got a majority of the fleet we're going to have 10 years from now because of the time it takes to build ships and because of the length of the life of those ships. We had to do something that could use the existing propulsion plants. Um, and those engines, those diesels, those jets, can't tell the difference. Susan Gittleson, thank you, thank you. Among the, the admirable things that you said is that you listen to others. And today we had an extraordinary opportunity to listen to you. Now, since you're the Secretary of the Navy and the President is uh, in Asia, uh, and we just sold uh, naval warships to India and so forth, could you give us your uh, strategic perspective on the, uh, the priorities for the Navy in a very expanded world. It's not just the Atlantic and the Gulf, but it's also the Indian Ocean and many other places that can be reached best through the seas. Okay. I'll, I'll give you a, the Cliff Notes version, if <laughs> that's all right, but you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the reason we need a naval presence is even in today's world, 90% of all our trade goes by sea. 95% of all telecommunications go under the sea. Um, we have, as I said, 288 ships today. Today, more than half of them are underway. Uh, more than 40% are forward deployed. We are the only global fleet in the world today, and I think we need to be. I think we need to have that presence. We need to have that presence because we can, on these same platforms, whether it's carriers, whether it's um, destroyers, the item missile destroyers, whether it's amphibious ships, we can do high-end conventional warfare if we have to. We can do irregular warfare. We can do blue water operations or brown water. We can be out in the middle of the ocean or close to shore. We can do humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. We are always the first responder to Haiti, to the tsunami in Indonesia, to Pakistan when the floods happened. Uh, we can also do partnership building, as I talked about, in these partnership stations. Um, so our, our priorities are to have the most flexible platforms that we can to have the most flexible people that we can, because I think that's what differentiates us from virtually every other military on Earth. The Marines have a term called the strategic corporal, uh, that every corporal in the Marine Corps needs to know why that corporal is there, what they're up to, what the purpose is, and be a diplomat as well as a soldier. A lot of times when a Navy ship with Marines embarked pulls into a port, West Africa, in the Caribbean, in the South Pacific. It may be the only Americans that people will ever see. Uh, the face of America are those sailors and Marines. We can do all these things without taking up one inch of anybody else's territory because we can come from the sea. So that's our priority. Um, now, you know, we've got geographical aims and issues. The President's given us the responsibility for ballistic missile defense, uh, the first phase of the phase adaptive approach uh, for Europe, the Middle East, the Western Pacific, uh, with our Aegis system that, uh, that's been remarkably successful shooting down ballistic missiles. Uh, but 
regardless of the last thing I'll say, and I said it was the Cliff Notes version, but regardless of what dangers we see out there today, what risk we see out there today, there's almost certainly something that we don't know that may be out there in the next five years or 10 years. We just finished something called the Quadrennial Defense Review. It happens as the title suggests every four years. And we had a lot of very smart people working on that and came up with a good document. But if you had done that review in 1989, right before the wall came down, you would have been almost completely wrong about what the threats were that were gonna face us. If you'd have done it in 1999, before 9-11, again, you would have been more wrong than right. I'm not sure, nobody is sure what's out there. What we've gotta do as a priority is have people and equipment that can meet whatever threat comes over the horizon. Mr. James. Robert James, a businessman here in ex-Navy. Uh, I'm going to tell you my question first, and then I have a comment that uh, uh, goes this way. Do we really have a security problem? Comments first, afterwards. Over 60% of our crude comes from the West, Western Hemisphere. Maybe another 15 or 20% comes from, uh, West, from Indonesia and Western Africa. 20% uh, maybe comes from uh, the PG. Persian Gulf. Uh, as for energy, I'm not exactly sure, but the energy, if you're talking energy rather than crude oil, uh, energy, we probably have 80 or 85 percent of our energy comes from the United States and the Western Hemisphere. So, is it the Persian Gulf you're interested in? They've been our friends, Saudi Arabia, all of for for. 60 years. Uh, we have bases all over there. What is our security problem? Well, for one thing, it's not just the Persian Gulf. Um, Western Hemisphere also includes some countries that uh, may not have our best interest at heart. Um, secondly, that fuel, that energy, wherever it comes from, is susceptible to price shocks and to supply shocks. You saw it twice in the 70s. Um, you've, you've seen it again in terms of how much uh, the price has risen. Third is simply the, the climate issue that um, by one exploring more and more in the US offshore and around the world in harsher and harsher environments, in places that were marginal before or risky. Um, we, we open up bigger risks for things like the Gulf to happen. And I, don't, I think that those are risks that need to be, to be mitigated. But if you're, we do buy as a, as a nation most of our fossil fuels from somewhere other than this country. And I think by, and even if it's not coming to us, even if it's coming to our allies, we have some responsibilities if they're cut off, if they have fuel used as a weapon against them. So I think that we do have, I think it is a security issue. I lived for two years in Saudi Arabia and they, you know, I think it's very important, the, the friendship and the alliance that we have there. I'm not so sure we should be dependent on that part of the world for our energy, though. Uh, Edith Everett, I'm very heartened to hear your talk and your leadership. It's really gratifying to see you're out there doing the right thing, and that's great. My question is something you alluded to in your talk about uh, the Arctic. Uh, clearly, you're concerned about global warming, but there are people in Congress who think there's no such thing. So we count on your leadership. How do you convince people that this is a serious problem, not just for the Navy, but for all of us? 
We have set up something called Task Force Climate Change. Um, it's run by the Admiral that's the um, chief meteorologist and oceanographer for the Navy. And we try to make it absolutely science-based. We're having a retreat of the ice in the Arctic. Same thing in the Antarctic. The reason we're taking a specific interest in it from the Navy's point of view is, as I said, number one, if you have an ice-free Arctic and you begin to have ships transiting that, there is an obvious question about naval presence, about freedom of navigation, things like that, um, about how, where boundaries are, where, where and who gets to exploit the mineral resources that have been off limits before. But second, if you have sea level rise as a result, 70% of the world's population lives very close to the shore. And sea level rise can trigger instability, particularly in developing countries, which would call for some sort of maritime response. And so, again, it would be Navy, Marine Corps that would be called on uh, to do something if there is instability in these countries. And that's why, I mean, just from a military standpoint, we are very focused on climate change and, uh, and some of the implications that it has for us as a Navy and us as a Marine Corps uh, for, for the effects of that climate change. Time for one more. Okay. Over here, Sylvan. Thank you. Uh, Sylvan Barnett, Rotary International. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Former Lieutenant Commander. Thank you, sir. Uh, where do we stand on offshore drilling along the Atlantic from uh, New Jersey down to Georgia? Um, well, as you know, I'll go back to the Gulf for a second. The administration lifted its moratorium on deep water drilling in the Gulf. Uh, about two weeks before the well blew out, the Interior Department announced that it was opening up uh, areas in the along the Atlantic uh, for for exploration and for leasing. Uh, I think what is fair to say, the president has appointed this commission headed by um, former head of the EPA Riley and former senator and governor Graham from Florida to look at what the future of offshore drilling should be, what the safety requirements are, what the regulatory requirements should be. Uh, they are beginning to get toward the end of that process. And I guess the short answer is I don't know because I think that whatever recommendations they, they come out with, I know that inside Interior, the whatever the agency is that used to be known as the um, MMA, uh, Minerals Management Agency, um, they have increased surveillance, they have tightened down significantly in terms of the rules that they have and that the way that they enforce them on drilling that's, that's going on today. But in terms of future drilling, I think we'll have to wait for the President's Commission to come back and the administration will make a decision based on that. All right. well, thank, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah.